Hi, I'm Sonja Englert. Welcome to my airplane design tutorial number two. In my last tutorial, I talked about the preliminary design of the airplane and the importance of the wing. In this video, I'm going to continue with the wing and use my airplane initial design table to look at performance estimates. Once we have decided on what wing area the airplane needs, the next question to address is the wing span. Here, considerations about performance and structures are about to start. You will see that designing an airplane requires some knowledge in a number of different areas. If you keep the wing span the same while you change the wing area, you are also changing the aspect ratio. The aspect ratio and how it is calculated is illustrated with these two wings. Wing 1 has a small aspect ratio, wing 2 has a large or high aspect ratio. For example, an aspect ratio of 5 is considered low and an aspect ratio of 20 is high. Gliders are good examples for the use of high aspect ratio wings. Basically, the higher the aspect ratio, the lower is the rate of sink, power off or the rate of climb with power. It is like built-in free performance. So why are gliders the only aircraft that have such high aspect ratio wings? Because nothing is ever free. The longer and thinner the wings are, the higher is the bending moment at the root. The wing is like a beam, where the air pulls upwards and the weight of the fuselage and everything that it is attached to it pushes down. Because the fuselage is usually in the center, that's where the wing bending stress is the highest. If you use a long, thin wooden stick, support it at the ends and push down on it in the middle, that's where it would break. If you use a short, thicker stick, you will have to push, mu push much harder in the middle before it breaks. To keep glider wings from breaking, the spars have to be very strong and heavy. The weight of the fuselage must not exceed the weight the wings were designed for, or they will break sooner. So the aspect ratio of an airplane wing is therefore a compromise between performance and weight. At cruise speeds, a high aspect ratio has less benefit unless the airplane flies very high, like airliners, so their engine power is used to achieve good climb performance with a lower aspect ratio and therefore a lighter wing. The aspect ratio is one of the things that is calculated in my airplane de initial design table. While we are on the subject of the wing, I want to throw in two more design features that you will need to decide on, the incidence and the dihedral of the wing. The incidence is basically the angle that the wing is attached to the fuselage with. In order to define an angle, you need to have two reference lines. The first one is the reference line for the wing, the chord line in the cruise configuration. The airfoil chord line is defined as a straight line from the trailing edge to the center of the leading edge. This line is also used for reference on all aerodynamic calculations. The reference line for the fuselage is a straight line, for example from the tip of the spinner to the tail. In cruise, this line is assumed to be level for minimum drag and the best forward visibility for the pilot. The fuselage line is usually also used as its x-axis. The angle between the two lines is called wing incidence. It is usually positive in the order of 1 to 4 degrees, but it may be zero for an aerobatic airplane. The reason why it normally should be positive is that the wing needs to be at a positive angle to the airflow to create lift, but the fuselage should be at zero degrees for minimum drag. The exact number depends on which airfoil is used, its camber and the expected cruise angle of attack for the airplane. More about this later. The dihedral is the angle of the wings from the horizontal when looking at the front view. A positive angle that means up at the wingtip serves two purposes. It improves the lateral stability, that means the ability to roll the airplane with the rudder only, and if the airplane has wing tanks, the lowest point is at the inboard end of the tank, which makes it a convenient location for the fuel line pickup and drain valve. Low-wing airplanes require a little more dihedral than high-wing airplanes for the same effect. Typical numbers are 4 degrees for a low-wing airplane, 2 degrees for a high-wing, and 0 degrees for an aerobatic airplane. 
The next thing that is calculated by my airplane initial design table is the useful load. We initially estimated the empty weight of the airplane by comparing it with other airplanes of similar design to get a starting point. The gross weight is an important number that will later be used to calculate the loads on the airplane. Therefore it has to be set in stone early on. It's easy to guesstimate the empty weight too low. Most airplanes end up being heavier than expected or hoped for, so be generous with the gross weight and set it to the highest reasonable looking number. With reasonable looking number I mean that this number is going to be the main input for sizing the landing gear structure and most of the other structure as well. If it is set too high, the structure may end up heavier than necessary. On the other hand, if it's set too low, the useful load may suffer to a point where it's really not useful anymore. With a gross weight of 1200 pounds, for example, and an empty weight of 980 pounds, a 180 pound pilot can only bring 40 pounds of fuel along, which is about 6.7 gallons. This will not get you very far in most airplanes. Again, look at existing airplanes to see what their numbers are. For a two-seater, it would be good to have at least 450 pounds of useful load. A good number for comparison with other airplanes is the relative useful load. This is simply the percentage of the useful load relative to the empty weight. If, for example, the number shown in the table is 50%, it means that the useful load, for example 400 pounds, is half of the empty weight at 800 pounds. The fuel capacity is selected to fit the mission of the airplane. The table will show you what the endurance and range would be with the selected engine power and tank volume. 20 gallons in a light two-seater will give you a respectable range when combined with an efficient engine like, like a Rotax 912, but if you have 300 horsepower available, you better increase that volume to more than 50 gallons. Another best guess we have to make initially as input data is the projected cruise speed at 75% power. Don't give in to wishful thinking and believe it will certainly fly 190 knots on 100 horsepower. Be realistic and again compare your estimate with existing airplanes. Here it is okay to estimate on the low side and be happy if the airplane ends up flying faster than that. From the input data the program calculates some basic performance numbers. These are not very accurate since a lot of design details that influence the performance are still open. Rather it is intended to show you what is reasonably possible. The climb performance shown here is mainly a function of the aspect ratio and the power loading. It does not take the other drag of the airplane or the propeller into account. It just assumes that the airframe is reasonably clean and the propeller suitable for the application. Similarly, the takeoff roll calculated here is only a function of the stall speed with takeoff flaps and the gross weight and the engine power. Again, the assumptions are a suitable propeller and a fairly aerodynamically clean airframe. So once the table is filled with this initial design data, you have a framework from which to go into more details. I will cover the fuselage in the next video.